My name is Serge Bromertz. I'm from Belgium. Everyone knows that there are the Flemish and French-speaking Belgium, but I'm coming from the German-speaking minority, 70,000 Belgium in the east of Belgium. Um, I've been a prosecutor for the last 30 years, uh, 15 years in Belgium, first in my hometown, later on in Brussels, as coordinator for organized crime and later as federal chief prosecutor. And for the last 15 years, I, I worked at the international level, uh, three years at the International Criminal Court as Deputy Prosecutor, two years in Lebanon as the Commissioner for the Hariri Investigation Commission after the assassination of the Prime Minister there. And uh, since 2008, um, I was the Chief Prosecutor of the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and for the last three years, the Prosecutor of the International Residual Mechanism for International Criminal Tribunals. So What is it? Uh, in fact, in 93, uh, the Security Council set up the Yugoslav Tribunal when the conflict in the former Yugoslavia was still ongoing. And in 94, after the genocide in Rwanda, the Security Council, UN Security Council, put in place the Rwanda Tribunal. Both tribunals have been in existence for many, many years. A um, few years ago, uh, the Rwanda Tribunal first, and three years ago, the Yugoslav Tribunal were, were closed. Um, by decision by Security Council. But at the same time, there were a number of residual functions which still needed to be performed. So both tribunals were closed by the kind of success organization was put in place, uh, taking over the remaining functions. Those remaining functions for the Yugoslav Tribunal, which is um, where the mechanism is situated in, in uh, The Hague, is uh, the remaining trials and appeals. We have one very important appeal still ongoing in relation to General Mladic, who is considered as being the mastermind behind the ethnic cleansing campaigns. Uh, he was convicted in uh, first instance uh, for, to a life sentence for war crimes, crimes of humanity and, and genocide. Um, we are also working uh, intensively with the countries in the former Yugoslavia because there are in Sarajevo alone more than 3,500 cases still ongoing. This is very often what we are also trying to explain to all interlocutors. Well, the ICTY had 161 indictments, which is more than all international tribunals before, or more than the International Criminal Court, but it only represents a very small part of the potential cases. So uh, for the next years to come, the main function of the residual mechanism the branch in the Hague will be to support national proceedings. We are receiving hundreds of requests for assistance to help prosecutors in the former Yugoslavia. We have, for example, on a permanent basis, a liaison prosecutor from Serbia and the liaison prosecutor from <coughs> Bosnia Herzegovina in our office. So that's very much for, for the office in uh, the Hague. And then the second office of the mechanism is the Arusha branch. What are we doing there? Well, there are some proceedings still ongoing in relation to contempt of court. But the main activity for my office there is the search for remaining fugitives. Uh, you know, in relation to the Yugoslav Tribunal, uh, all fugitives which were wanted and which were under international restaurants had been arrested and trials have taken place. But when the Rwanda Tribunal formally closed, there were still eight fugitives at large. And this is the, the main activity of the Office of the Prosecutor in Arusha is to look and to uh, yeah, try to find those remaining fugitives. Every six months we are reporting about our work to the Security Council, what we have done in July, where we explain where we are with the remaining cases and where we think some of the fugitives are, which brings me to one of those aspects we uh, have discussed, which is international cooperation. Uh, international tribunals don't have their own police or their own military. For the mechanism, it's the same. We have to rely on the support we are getting from countries where we think fugitives are or on the support of countries who have influence on those countries who are possibly hiding, hiding fugitives. So it's still um, a, a number of different activities, um, still more than 100 people, almost 100 people who are working for the Office of the Prosecutor at our main offices in The Hague in, in Arusha, but also at our field offices in Sarajevo and Kigali.
there are major differences between working at the prosecutor at the national level. If you work with organized crime groups, uh, violence has always a very specific objective, and it's mainly to, to, to increase uh, gain and, and benefit in, in committing crimes. If you look at um, international crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide, you have obviously uh, a political dimension. Perpetrators are always those who are the most powerful in society. And the victims are always the most vulnerable in society, the weak link, women, children, elderly people who uh, are, are the victims. Uh, it's here about, uh, it's about territory, it's about political power, um, and um, what is one of the, the most difficult aspects to understand from a human perspective is how those military and political leaders manage to convince their own citizens to kill so many other citizens in the same country. Uh, how uh, they are able to convince uh, their soldiers, uh, their followers, that the others have not the right to live and uh, sh should be, be destroyed. Uh, of course, we speak about diff different crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against, uh, crime against humanity and, and genocide. And your question was, okay, what is the difference? between genocide and those other crimes. Because in the, in the popular understanding, uh, genocide is, 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 has a more broader meaning. For us, it is difficult in court to prove that genocide has been committed because you have a very specific uh, intent you have to prove. You have to prove as a prosecutor, with all means and documentary evidence, uh, witnesses, military orders, that uh, the crimes were committed with the intent to destroy a certain group entirely or in part based on their ethnicity or, or based on, on their religion or based on their race. And uh, it means, of course, a very, very massive violence uh, you have to, to establish, but it's really this, this criminal intent which makes it difficult and which makes it different from crimes against humanity, which are uh, widespread and systematic crimes committed against a civilian, a civilian population. Uh, for us, as I said, uh, those are all extremely grave crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide. But for, for victims, we sometimes have even the impression that victims are saying, you know, we, if we are not recognized as victims of genocide, we are not really recognized as victims at all. And this is a, a sometimes a, a little bit an unfortunate uh, a reality, because we consider all those crimes as the gravest possible. Well, it is obvious that realpolitik has uh, a direct impact on accountability. Um, if a country um, is not willing to investigate or prosecute at the national level, where the only alternative is um, have investigation or prosecution in a third country, if they have jurisdiction, or to have an international mechanism or international tribunal or, uh, or hybrid tribunal to, to deal with it. Uh, if we look at the situation in relation to Syria or to Yemen or Myanmar, uh, it is obvious that there was no political consensus to set up an international accountability mechanism in form of a tribunal. But we have seen a number of uh, decisions taken also by the Security Council or by the General Assembly uh, where um, an investigative mechanism was, was put in place, like uh, it is the case for Myanmar or in relation to Syria, or um, as the Security Council decided in relation to, um, to Iraq, where uh, also an international uh, advisor, an international team has been put in place to, to help national jurisdictions to, uh, to do their work. What one can see somehow as a tendency today, in addition to the International Criminal Court, which obviously has an important role to play, is more tailor-made solutions, where obviously more primacy is given to national jurisdictions than what currently the Myanmar mechanism or the Syria mechanism are doing is collecting information to be made available to national jurisdictions. Uh, currently, in relation to, to uh, crimes committed in Syria, the, the major investigations which are taking place are in, in European countries, where Syria fighters are, are back in Germany, in France, in Belgium, and elsewhere. And we are currently, the main accountability for crimes committed in Syria is taking place at national jurisdictions, in third countries. And I would like to say in this regard that as a prosecutor, international prosecutor, it really doesn't matter if it's a, a hybrid 
a national or an international court, as long as for survivors and for victims there is hope that one day perpetrators are prosecutors and justice is being done. And obviously in the world today there is, let's say it mildly, a lot of room for improvement to uh, bring uh, more justice to more victims and survivors. You know, in my yeah, more than 10 years as prosecutor of the Yugoslav Tribunal, I met every second month, I would say, victims organizations, survivor organizations, very often the Mothers of Srebrenica, which is one of the main victims organizations. And um, our interaction with them has been very, very important in the former Yugoslavia, but also in Rwanda. I was last month in, in Kigali, where uh, I have always meetings with uh, victims organizations as well. And if you look at the Yugoslav Tribunal alone, we had more than 4,000 witnesses coming forward to testify at uh, different trials. And many of those, those witnesses are, are survivors who again and again came back to, be, to speak about the crimes they were victims of. Well, as mechanism, we have uh, a very limited mandate. It's called residual mechanism because we, we are dealing with those few remaining cases in The Hague and we are looking for those eight remaining fugitives. Uh, but I would say um, an important task for the mechanism today is really to help national jurisdictions in doing, doing their job. I think we had last year more than 50,000 pages of documents transferred to bosnia Herzegovina for domestic prosecution. So while we are not anymore in the, in the driver's seat, if I may say, to conduct investigations and prosecutions in The Hague, we are providing crucial support for uh, national uh, investigations. And as I said earlier, there are several thousand investigations still ongoing in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And, um, you know, if we look at the, the archives of the tribunal, they are huge. If you look at the database of the Office of the Prosecutor, we speak about 10 million pages of documents. It's the largest collection of evidence, uh, expert reports, uh, uh, witness statements in relation to the conflict in the former Yugoslavia. So I'm expecting that the mechanism will, for many years to come, provide crucial support to national jurisdictions in the former Yugoslavia, but also in relation to Rwanda, and in relation to third countries, because there are still a number of investigations and prosecutions ongoing in relation to the Rwanda genocide in third countries, but also in relation to crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia. Yeah, definitely. The, the most important case still ongoing at the mechanism is definitely the one of General Mladic. He was indicted in 1995 um, in, in relation to uh, crimes, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide in relation to the, the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina between 1992 and 1995. He was the highest level uh, general uh, in charge of military operations there. So he has been always uh, one of the most wanted fugitives. He was a fugitive until 2011 uh, when he was arrested and where a few years later the trial started, where the appeals proceedings took on, and where he was uh, last year convicted uh, to a life sentence for genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Currently the appeals proceedings are still ongoing and we should have before the end of the year uh, an appeals uh, judgment. It's definitely one of the most important cases in the history of the tribunal. As I said earlier, uh, General Mladic together with Karadzic were really the two, two masterminds who had designed the policy of ethnic cleansing and who were both instrumental in having thousands and many, many thousands of people losing their life, their homes, and which also are have been prosecuted for massive sexual violence, which has been committed by soldiers under their command. I have been a prosecutor for the last 30 years, 15 years in Belgium and 15 years at the international level. When you are a prosecutor in Belgium um, and a crime is committed, you have very easy access to the crime scene. You have your investigators, you have your experts, everyone you need to go on the crime scene. You have the support by the public opinion because the people want justice to be done and you have the support by the government, because governments want the judicial system to function. Um, well, if you work at the international level, the situation is very, very different. Uh, almost 100% of your investigation is taking place abroad, at a different place than where the tribunal is located. So you have all the issues of 
access to the crime scenes to start with. You know, when the Srebrenica genocide took place in July 95, it took investigators of this tribunal almost one year before being able to access the crime scene for, for security reasons. So, international level, access to the crime scene is very, very difficult. You have a limited number of investigators you can rely on. This is one of the difficulties. You know, you have to deal with the worst crimes humanity can imagine or can see, but you have always a very limited number of investigators you can put on those cases. Very often you don't have the support by the public opinion because people you are investigating or prosecuting are considered as heroes uh, in their own communities. And the same politicians in those countries are not necessarily supportive because they want very often to be re-elected and uh, will do what the majority of population is expecting from them. So we have seen uh, during many years that someone like Karadzic or Mladic that the majority of people in Serbia were against their, their arrest and it was uh, only because uh, there were incentives created by the international community, political regimes changed and because there was the perspective of, of EU enlargement that finally all the remaining fugitives were arrested. So my point is really that international investigations are having problems at many, many levels which are very absent if you investigate and work within a domestic jurisdiction. One of the reasons that international justice and international tribunal exist is deterrence. Uh, deterrence uh, to dictators out there in the world to make sure that they're not committing crimes. Uh, that's why it's so important that there are accountability mechanisms everywhere at the national system where possible, but where a country is unable or unwilling to bring perpetrators to justice, there should be uh, inter an international system which is coming in because deterrence is very, very important and the clear message needs to be given to perpetrators out there that, well, uh, accountability will take place one day, if not in your country, because you are too powerful, hopefully somewhere else.